welcome to Light in Your Way, a program of the Covenant Meridian Church. This week we are happy for you to join us as we celebrate Palm Sunday. Today, my brothers and 
sisters is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, on which we stage the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Triumphal is something that is carried out in celebration of a great victory of achievement. But at this point I want to ask, what was so great at this point in Jesus' ministry that caused them to stage this entry and has caused us to claim that it was his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Another question that I would like us to ask this morning is that if this is such a glorious Sunday for all Christians, what went wrong? by Good Friday, that Jesus could find himself betrayed by one of his disciples, arrested by the high priest God, accused by a coalition of religious leaders, tried by the Roman governor, and sentenced to die the death of a common criminal, which was the death by crucifixion. So, if this is such a glorious entry, what caused all of this that in a matter of days everything was changed? If this was a triumphal entry, what went so terribly wrong that days after the same people that celebrated his entry rejected him and called for his execution? You see, Palm Sunday is riddled with contradictions. What to point out is that with the contradiction of the event is uh, the contrasting processions that you had on the occasion. You see, the historians tell us that Jesus' procession was not the only procession, but that there was a procession by Pilate himself. In the year AD 30, the Roman historian record that Pontius Pilate, the governor of the region, led a procession of Roman cavalry and centurions into the city of Jerusalem. It was the beginning of the Passover that Jewish festival which celebrated the liberation of the Jews from another foreign oppressor. This time, or that time, was the Egyptians. So the Jews had previously revolted in AD 4 after the death of Herod the Great. And the, that revolt was uh, vigorously suppressed. So on this occasion now, Pilate had traveled from his headquarters in Caesarea to Jerusalem to send a message to the Jews who might be plotting against the empire of Rome to remind them that what happened in AD 4 would not happen again. And if it did, they would suffer the same fate that they did then. It was Pilate's intention to intimidate the citizens of Jerusalem themselves 
so that they would think twice before joining another rebellion. So Pilate's procession was meant to show military might and strength. Jesus' procession, on the other hand, was to show the opposite. Both Matthew and Mark recorded Jesus saying, giving the instructions to his disciples, go and you'll find a donkey tied up and untie him. And if asked, why are you doing that? Say, the Lord needs it. You see, Jesus was quoting from Zechariah, the ninth chapter, where it says, Say to the daughter of Zan, See, your king comes to you gently and riding on a donkey, on a colt, a fold of a donkey. In Zechariah 9, the prophet reassures the people of Judah that God had not forgotten them. God would liberate them. And so, the people's understanding of Jesus' choice of entry into Jerusalem on this occasion was that God would deliver them from another oppressor. In this time, the oppressor Rome. So, the contradiction that I speak of was that Pilate's procession on the occasion depicted worldly power and suppression, and Jesus' procession riding on a donkey to Jerusalem embodies peace and tr tranquility. That God's reign, God's peace would bring to his disciples or to his people. The next contradiction you'll see is that in the leadership challenge that was, propo that was proposed on this occasion, Palm Sunday depicts the people choosing Jesus' leadership. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes, they shouted. And by the end of the week, Jesus would have disappointed the crowd at a rate faster than they could stand. And they would turn on him and even those closest to him would also turn against him. His disciples were either betrayed outright, betrayed him outright, or abandoned him in fear and confusion. Hosanna! To the son of David was their shout. And by such, they were placing their faith in Jesus that could restore the glory of the nation, of the Davidic reign, of the time when David, followed by his son Solomon, would rule a united nation. The, the time, this time, they claimed that the Messiah would bring back the glory of Israel, would rid the nation of oppressor, and would rule benevolently, and would be kind to the common people. And so, they were seen in Jesus' entry, a political overthrow. While Jesus 
was not focusing on political overthrow. His focus was on the local society and what was wrong with that local society. Jesus had challenged the rulers of Judea, Judea itself, not the Roman rulers, you notice. He had said to the rulers of the temple that the temple would be destroyed. And the temple wasn't the only place that you could get forgiveness of sins from. Temple would be destroyed and not one stone would be left on another. And so those who had made their living from the temple, like the scribes, the chief priests, and the priests, the ruling council of the Sanhedrin, the religious parties of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they would all lo lose their power. They would all lose their prestige. If what Jesus was claiming would be implemented. So Jesus by his very act had disappointed and alienated the powerful people. He did so because the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the scribes and most of the Levitical priests and others who had rule on Rome's behalf were a part of the system of oppression, the system of domination that Pilate was a part of. And Jesus was crying out at the immorality that was in the midst. The leadership challenge of Jesus was how to get the people to understand his true mission. His mission was to save Judea from moral decay. Their focus was their political salvation. So the dilemma here was political salvation versus moral salvation. So I now return to the question. On the occasion of the triumphal entry, what went so terribly wrong that the same people who had celebrated Jesus' entry rejected him days later and called for his execution. The answer lies in the contradictions that I've pointed out. The contrasting procession where you see military might over the procession of the peace that God sends. It was in the leadership challenge where the focus was on the overthrow of foreign rulers versus the casting out of immorality as practiced by the locals. It was a contradiction of a man's this misguided solution versus God's will. You see, the people did not recognize God's will for them. And even though they had chosen Jesus as their leader, their lack of recognition of God's will led them to believe that Jesus would do his deliverance in a particular way. And when he did not act as they expected, they were disappointed 
and rejected him. And that's why days later they could turn on him in the way they did. Mark the point. They chose the right leader. But they expected that leader to act in a particular way. And when he did not act in the way they chose, they rejected the right leader. So they were only prepared to do what they think the leader should do. So Palm Sunday shows that the people's lack of recognition of God's will can lead to disappointment. Today, my brothers and sisters, we are caught up in the same dilemma. There is sickness upon the land and we need healing. But we determine that the healing must be in a particular way. And if the healing doesn't come in the way we say the healing must come, then we lose our faith. We are in need. We need a job. And we are fixated on the type of job that we should get. And we pray to God for the type of God, the job we should get. And we fail to recognize God's calling to us. God saying to us, use your gift in a particular way. And because we see it not, we get disappointed. We need eternal salvation. And what is it? We are awaiting the miraculous transformation. And not seeing the simplicity of the gospel. Not seeing the simplicity of confessing our sins. Accepting forgiveness. And turning to him. And so we sit and we wait. Because we don't see. We don't see the spirit coming and grabbing us. And taking us out of control. Because that is the way we have determined that the spirit must act in our lives, you know. That is the way. The only way. The spirit calls. So we accept God. But. We are saying that God must act in this way. For him to be God. We're facing the COVID-19 crisis today. And we can't afford to make the same mistake of predetermining God's will for us in that crisis. We need to be able to discern God's will in this crisis. And this now leads me to address the question of how do we pray? How do we commune with God? Because if there's ever time for us to praise now, and prayer is communing with God. But my brothers and sisters, we need to know how to pray. And especially now, we need to know how to pray. 
Jesus in John 16 from verse 23 taught his disciples about praying. He says, in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive it, and your joy will be complete. Jesus says, ask in my name. Ask in Jesus' name. What does that mean? To ask in Jesus' name is to ask as though Jesus himself was asking. And when we can only ask for what Christ himself would ask, it is therefore necessary for us to set aside our own will and accept God's will. So in asking in Jesus' name, we really are trying to ascertain what is God's will for us. Prayer, my brothers and sisters, is not dictating to God, but humbly and heartfelt expression of our attitude of dependency and need on Him. So as we communicate to God in prayer in this crisis, we need to consider also the question that Isaiah in Isaiah 40 verse 13 that he put to the people. Who could ever have told you or told God what to do or taught him his business? So when we pray, we're not telling God what to do. Who could ever do that? As the message translation tells us. Jesus informs us further in Matthew 6 and verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. So when we go to God, we're not going to God to tell him what to do or tell him what you need. He knows it already. But James, James 4 and verse 3 said something very important which I want to bring home to us. James, in chapter 4 and verse 3, informs us that the motive behind our power is of utmost importance. He says, when you ask and you do not receive, you do not receive. Because you ask with the wrong motive that you spend what you give on your pleasure. Huh? Many times when we spend time asking, we're asking for what gives us pleasure. But not in fire of the will of God. We trust that you enjoy the service and you were empowered by God as we contemplated the message of this Palm Sunday amidst the COVID crisis. We ask that you join us live on Facebook each Sunday at the Covenant Moravian Church as we continue to offer our worship and our praise to Almighty God. See you next week. And I call you to communicate with us at the detailed information on your screen about the Covenant Moravian Church.